Church, Palapinta County Cowboy Church, where people greet you with a smile and a shame. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, what a place. Hi, I'm Taylor, and this is Mickey. Thank you for participating with us online here today at Palapinta County Cowboy Church. If you have received a blessing from the message today, please consider partnering in ministry with us in spreading God's word. You can do this by going to palopintocowboychurch.com and scrolling to the left side of the home page. Click on the link, click here to give. Thank you for partnering with us and enjoy today's message. Flip that hand out over and start singing with us this morning. Uh, will the circle be unbroken? There are loved ones in the glory whose dear forms you often miss. When you close your earthly story. I think you're about half asleep, so stand up for me, will you? There you go. Put your hand out down on the... You can use it as a seat cushion for a minute. There you go. Now put your hands together. Put a smile on your face. Look at your neighbor. Make sure they're smiling. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to being in the sky. Amen? i tell you what. So I want you to sing it like you mean it. He's going to sing it one more time. There you go. Two, one. Will the circle be unbroken?
the sky, Lord, in the sky. Be seated. One, two, three. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Don't go down to feed it. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. At the gate called Beautiful, laid out in the street. Poor and lonely beggar who was crippled in his feet. And as John and Peter passed him, they saw his need was bad. They had no gold or silver, but they gave him all they had. Hey, get up, get up. Get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Don't go down to faint it while the is here to claim. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. You gotta get up, stand up. In the day which we live in, there's evil everywhere. Body seems to scare overcome the fear. Well, God is needing a soldier to get out of the pews and take hold of the power that John and Peter used. Get up. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Don't go down to feed it while victory's here to play. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. Yeah, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. Yeah, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up in Jesus'
shall come with sounds of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall adoration and they proclaim my God how great the Talk.
Time to sign up, or not to sign up, send our kids to uh, Kids Corral. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got everybody here. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Yeah, he's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the whole world. got to ask you a question I'm, I'm looking out see the the joy of being the drummer is you get to sit back here and you get to watch people I'm a people watcher do you know that I'm watching you some of you don't look very happy today as a matter of fact some of you look mad are, are you mad today okay all right some of you look mad you know you know I don't know but when I sing uh, have a little talk with Jesus I like talking to Jesus well 10 of us do that's good the rest of you just not do it, or if you, if you try it, you might like it. Trust me. I guarantee you. Yeah, I like talking to Jesus. So usually when I talk to Jesus and then I talk about talking to Jesus, you got all that? When you talk about talking about Jesus or talking to Jesus, it usually creates a smile on your face. But I'm telling you, some of you out there look like you're mad at God today. So I hope you get happy. Amen. Amen. I tell you what, it, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Yes, it is. And I am glad that you're here. And again, visitors, I'm very glad that you're here. I hope that you'll come back and see us. Uh, I have uh, contemplated several sermons this week. As a matter of fact, I even gave Natalie uh, and Clinton and Adam all them slates to make this particular sermon. And I put it on Facebook, which was my mistake probably. But I uh, put it on there and I said, you know, we're going to do one called, uh, I think it was called Shut Your Mouth, something like that. I don't remember what it was. Because, and the reason I don't remember what it was is because God said, uh, no, you're not going to do that. And when God says no, we back up and we start over, okay? So he's got us doing something today that I think is going to speak to all of us called, don't blow it. Now look at your neighbor and say, don't blow it. Now you better get used to doing that because we're going to do that several times a day. Stand with me. We're going to read Haggai chapter 1. And if you have an issue finding Haggai in your Bible... Uh, I know some of us preachers that don't always preach out of some of these will turn to Ephesians where we can find and we'll just sit there like, yes, brother, that's good. That's good stuff. Okay, y'all don't, y'all have never done that, have you? Okay. If you don't, it's up here uh, on our screens today. And, and I want you to read with me, please, because it says now, now, right now, now, there you go. It says, therefore, and any time you see anything in the Bible that says, therefore, you got to figure out what it's. There, I right, see you're catching on. That's good. Y'all are a quick crowd today. Good. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Boy, I mean, didn't he just slaps us right upside the head right at the first, doesn't he? Consider your ways. You have sown much and you have harvested little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. 
And he who earns wages earns wages to put them in a, to a bag with holes. Does it ever feel like that your income goes through a bag with giant holes in the bottom of it? And you can relate to what Haggai is saying here. Yeah, that's right. There's always more month than money, isn't there? Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and rebuild the house. By the way, we're talking this house is the temple. This house is the temple. That I may take pleasure in it and be what? Glorified. Do you know that we're here today to do one thing? That's to glorify God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good. Says the Lord, you looked for much. And it came too little. And when you brought it home, I want you to underline this phrase when you sit down if you've got your Bible in front of you. It says, I blew it away. I blew it away. Now, understand, this is God talking. This is God talking. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its crops. I called for a drought on the land and in the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on men, on livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together, Father. We do. We come and glorify you and you only. Father, thank you for your word that's going to speak to our hearts today. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would remove those obstacles inside of us and in our minds today that would cause us not to hear. Father, thank you for being present in this place. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, quick question. Let's see if we can get a uh, consensus here in this place. Do you believe that God always provides? All right, let me see some hands. How many of you believe that God always provides? Isn't that awesome? Aren't you glad we worship a God that has master or is the master over every single thing? Okay, some of you don't believe that, so we're going to try again. Aren't you glad that we worship a God that is the master over every single thing? Yeah. Now, see, now I believe you now. All right, good. Okay, good. Do you believe he is the source of everything that is? Yeah. That's right. Amen. Guys, put up my slide here for me. Uh, if you would, and I think we should have it. Y'all have an extra slide? There we go. Does this look familiar? I tell you what, I, I keep thinking about this, and I think about all the years that we've had fires here. Uh, if you've lived here any time at all, you know that over the last probably four or five years, probably four out of the last five, we've had big fires of some kind, haven't we? You know, and I keep thinking about this, and maybe this is what drove this message today because we've been in big conversation about uh, all of these wildfires, and uh, I know we've got some of our church members that have been helping put some of them out, and, and I keep thinking about why do we always have this? I mean, it, is God mad? I mean, is, does, is God just, uh, he, is, he just removed his hand from this county, and has he removed his hand from Colorado and Utah and California and places like that? Has God just lifted his hand and said, you know what, I'm going to leave them to themselves? It would seem to be, in, the commu in this community maybe, perhaps, that the rain provision is not to hear. I mean, we, you and I have been praying for rain. How long have we been praying for rain? Years, right? Now, let me ask you this question. Is it lack of provision? In other words, if God's in charge of all things and he's in charge of the rain, then it's not lack of rain. I want you to think about this real carefully. If, if the rain is in, in his control and the provision of rain is in his control, then the provision's not lacking. And I think sometimes we pray for the provision of rain, don't we? What if, and I'm going to give you this what if, what if God is waiting for us to humble ourselves and get in position to receive the rain? You believe that? I believe that. I believe that because I think that God has control over everything. You just admitted it. We just all said it, didn't we? So he has control over the rain. So I want to talk to you a few minutes about this and about provisions and blessings and how all this work. Now, I, I tell you, the thing that I, I got to notice in uh, the very first part of this is, is that God says, you know, uh, he himself said, don't blow it. 
don't blow it. Matter of fact, a while ago I had you turn around to your neighbor. I said, don't blow it. Do it again. Find the other person and say, don't blow it. Now, you're going to get tired of this for the day's over with because this is, the, this is the whole thing right here. This is the whole thing right here. Why would a good God allow something to blow away in yours and my life? Why would he blow it away? Now, that doesn't sound like the God I know because the God I know says, as we sang while the world, he's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. You know, I, I don't know why would a God that has the whole world in his hand blow something away that was meant for you and I. Think about that for a minute. Now, when something bad happens in yours and my life, who do we blame first? Who do we blame first? And no, not your spouse. Quit doing that. <laughs> Unless your spouse is the devil, maybe they could be. I don't know. I really don't know. We blame the devil, don't we? I'm a, I want you to finish this sentence. The devil made me. Yeah, the devil gets press time. And have you ever thought that the devil gets more press time than God does? Because anytime something bad happens, like maybe you're on your way to church today and the car started acting up, or I know some of you that have had flats on the way to church, and the first thing you go, well, the devil just doesn't want me to go to church. Right? Amen? Yeah, so the devil gets all the, all the face time here. But what if, what if, what if? God caused a season in your life to point you back to him. In other words, well, let me rephrase that because I don't believe God causes stuff. I believe God allows stuff. Okay, so let me rephrase that. God allowed a season in your life to point you back to him. All right? Yeah, it's possible, isn't it? And, and, and then the old devil's getting credit for it. But see, if, if you believe that God has control over your life, the devil doesn't. If you believe that God has control over your life, the devil does not, unless you give it to him. Amen? Okay, good. Hey, are y'all all right? All right, all right. Preaching as hard as I know how to preach here, so... <laughs> But if you consider the passage today, God is saying, no, it wasn't the devil. I allowed that. I allowed that to change your mind about who the provider is in your life. Because you see, I am God. I am the master of all things. And when we lose perspective of that, God can say, you know what? I am going to allow a season in your life that will refocus you back to me where you will understand that what you have and where you are has been provided by me. Amen? Amen? I'll tell you what. Whew, I have to think about that a lot. A whole lot. Um, why would you blow it away? After all, don't you know what I want, God? Don't you get it? Don't you know that I want to do this? Don't you know that I want these things? Don't you know that I think it would be really good for me to have this? It would be really good for me to be a millionaire. And God says, you know what? I'm not going to bless you with that because you can't handle it. And then you'll start putting your faith in money, and you won't put your faith in me. See, God always knows what's best, doesn't he? Yeah. Whew. By the way, I want you to understand something. Anytime something like this happens and you go through a season, God's not punishing you. Lots of times we think, well, boy, God must just be really mad at me right now. Man, I'm going through some stuff. My wife and I, uh, uh, the Friday the 13th, right? How many of you had a really rough day Friday the 13th? Okay, I'm not, I'm not superstitious, but good Lord, I could not get rid of that day fast enough. I mean, it just seemed like everything was bad. Now, my wife wouldn't want me to tell this story, but I'm going to tell this story because it's really the only thing out of the... It's really the only thing that I think that some of you uh, will understand. Some of you are going to go, ooh, that's just gross. But, but I'm gonna, let me finish, okay, before you say this. My day culminated in the fact that I stuck some stuff in the dryer that had a full can of Copenhagen in it. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you know this, and this, this is a man thing, I guess. Maybe some of you, maybe some of you ladies have washed clothes with that in there. But I'm going to tell you something. When that hits water and hits a dryer... It goes everywhere. So my day ended with me cleaning the dryer. Uh, 
And I want you to know something. That was no easy task. All right. Now, yeah, some of you are going, wow, he's talking about Copenhagen in the pulpit. Wow. The um, thing about it is, is, you know, all of us go through things, don't we? And then sometimes you back off and you go, wow, why? I don't get it. Why? I mean, this whole day has just been a disaster, Lord. Why? I'm doing the best I can to try to serve you. I'm doing the best I can to try to prepare for Sunday. And you put this right in the middle of my week. And, you know, i got to be honest with you. Saturday, I was probably a whole lot more focused on God than I was when I started Friday. Because if I'm not doing anything else, I'm praying to God, God, I do not want another Friday this weekend. <laughs> Been there? You know what I'm talking about? God says, don't blow it. Don't blow it, Roger. You have a tendency to rely on your own strength and your own knowledge and your own works. I'm sitting here telling you right now, don't blow it because it is not about you. It is about me. And if I have to show you who's in charge, I'll do it. I'll do it. (laughs) Now, God has also said, you know, you got to remember it was mine to start with. You got to remember that I gave you breath, I gave you life, I gave you your very first breath and your very first heartbeat, and every single one of those breaths and every single one of those heartbeats since that point. They all belong to me. If I don't breathe out, you don't breathe in. Now, I believe that seasons in our life are caused because God wants us to understand this. If you start building a house, and when I say a house, a spiritual house, a physical house, I'm not talking about just a physical one like out of uh, uh, concrete and, and whatever you built your house on. I'm talking about you, the house. But when your house starts getting built and you start wandering away from God, God's going to test the foundation of that house. He's going to blow on it. <sighs> There we go. That's better. Blow on it. Again, he's going to go. Okay, what is, your, what is the foundation of your house built on? Is it built on something solid that will withstand a storm when it comes? Or is it very shallow built on what you want and what you think you want so it will blow over the minute that a hard time comes? Where's your foundation? God says that if you'll build your foundation on me, if you'll focus on me, if you'll keep your eyes on me, then your foundation will be strong. And when those seasons come along, and they will come along, by the way, when those seasons come along that test that foundation, you'll be able to withstand because you're standing on solid ground. Woo! You know, God would rather see us go through a season of frustration than to build our lives on the wrong foundation. Did you know that? So when you think the devil is doing all this, maybe God's simply saying, look, I'm testing your foundation. Where are you? What's it built on? Is it built on something that will just simply blow away? We are no different than the people of Haggai's day. And I bet these people in Haggai's day probably said some of the same things you and I say. When it comes to prayer, when it comes to church, when it comes to some of these type of things, I would imagine they said, you know what, we're going to get around to building the temple someday. Someday we're going to do this. Someday in the future we're going to take care of this. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. How many of you have used that phrase this week? Yeah, something you intended to do, you just haven't gotten around to it yet. Maybe it goes something like this. You know, me and my family, we were going to start praying together. We were going to do that. We were were getting around to it. We had it planned. We just never got there. Maybe we were going to make a commitment to get back in church with our family. And you're here today, so obviously I'm not talking to you. But you need to tell the people that were sitting next to you last week that are not here this week. He was talking about you this week. You do that? Maybe we're going to get back in church with our family. Maybe we're going to start tithing as a family. We just never got around to it. We just never got around to it. 
We thought about it. We thought about it a lot. We just never got there. Now, here's the problem. And, and guys, you know this, and we got a lot of our youth that are down here around the front row area right here. When, when we say we're going to get around to it as parents, guess what happens? These young people grow up and move off, and they never got the instruction that they needed to get while they were here because we never got around to it. We wanted to. We intended to. We just never got around to it. Just as verse 8 says, you have have had much, but now it is too little, too little time, too little opportunity, too little passion. It just doesn't seem important anymore, does it? Some of you have been real passionate. I think most of you that are here today are passionate people, or you wouldn't be here. You're passionate about God. But have you ever thought about time in itself? And you think about how you and I spend our time, there's not that much of it. You know, last week I had a birthday, and, and I, 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 I'm telling you, I don't, I don't feel my age, but, but it, I look back and I think, boy, yesterday I, 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 I must have had my 25th, 26th birthday because it just doesn't seem like that long ago. Amen? You look up and suddenly you're not 55, you're 75. And by the way, guys, be aware of this. Because time, I mean, it's like you pass certain mile markers and time seems like it speeds up a little bit, doesn't it? It does. Time, too little time. All right, turn to the person behind you and say, hey, don't blow your time. Some of us inside the time that God's given us have had opportunities and we've even wasted some of those opportunities, haven't we? You know, I don't think there's any greater pain, any greater heartache than the pain or heartache of a wasted opportunity. One of these days, you and I are going to be standing before Jesus Christ and he's going to look at us and he's going to look at a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name's not in there, this is going to be a wasted opportunity because you had years and years and years to come to Christ. And the pain and heartache of knowing that I should have, could have, and would have if I thought about it, that now time has run out and it's too late because I breathed my last breath and now I'm standing before an almighty God who has the right to judge me. And I've wasted my opportunity. Whew, don't blow it. To neglect your priorities is to forfeit your provision. Now, verse 5, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And I asked you to do this a while ago, and I want to ask you to think about this again. I want you to erase all the mess that you came in here with today, and I'm going to erase all my Friday the 13th, okay? But I want you to think for just a minute, and anything that's blocking your path or your communication between you and God today, take it out of your mind. There's nothing you can do about it right now. But God is going to try and speak to you today about something that is different than what you came in here thinking about. But he's going to have a really hard time doing that if your mind's full of a bunch of junk. Right? So Haggai is telling us to, to do this. Therefore, Consider your ways. Consider who you are, what you are, when it comes to a relationship with God. And then Haggai goes on to say, you have sown so much and you have harvested so little. In other words, you have been busy, I have been busy, we have been going and going and going, and no culture in time better understands busyness than this one right now. All right? How many of you are busy? Okay, how many of you are too busy? <laughs> See, most of you. We are busy. Busy, 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 busy. Right? We're filling all of our time slots with busyness. So Haggai says, I want you to stop for a minute. I want you to consider your ways. And then I want you to consider what you've sown in that busy time. Is what you have sown harvestable? Is that a word? I think it is. Harvestable. 
In other words, can you harvest something from it later? Or is it just time that you simply let go because you've been busy? You see, I believe there's a difference between busy and productive. Busy and productive. So Haggai is asking that question. Think about this for a minute. Haggai tells his people there's plenty of seed. In other words, God provides the seed. Amen? So there's not a lack of seed. God provides the rain. There's not a lack of rain. But God says, guess what? There is one thing I can do and will do if you don't place your eyes on me. I will interrupt the harvest. I will interrupt the harvest. And he did, didn't he? So verse 8, go with me to verse 8. Go up to the mountain. Now, I love this right here. This is my kind of verse because I love to go up to the mountain. I'm telling you, you know, and I talk about this a lot because it's just my sanctuary. But Haggai and I must be a whole lot of light because I'm saying go up to the mountain. Go up to that place where the provision is provided. In other words, we're fixing, fixing, that's the Texas word, right? Fixing. We're fixing to build a temple. So the mountain is the position. You've got to be in position first. Okay, think about this real carefully. The whole idea is for us to honor God and then be blessed, right? By the way, he will bless us if we honor him. So I'm not speaking out of context here. But if you're not in position first to be blessed, then nothing else can happen. I know you're getting this. Got to be in position. So up on the mountain is my position. I have to be in position to hear from God. I have to be in position to honor God. I have to be in position to respond to God. And then the next part of it says, and bring wood. Bring wood. In other words, take the wood off the mountain. Now, the wood in this particular case is the potential of a temple. It's not a temple yet. It's just wood. But it has the potential to be a temple. Right? Okay? So, we need to position ourselves to be in a place where the potential to get what we need is. Or what we need to be blessed with. All right? So, in other words, you will not reach your potential of being blessed until you're in the position to be blessed to start with. Okay, am I complicating this too much? Okay. All right. I want to make sure. Right. Go up to the mountain. Bring wood, the potential temple down. And then look at the next part. It says, rebuild the house. This is the process. All right? So you've got position where you are. You've got the potential of being receiving what you need to receive. And then you need to rebuild the house, which is the process. The rest of it says that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. That is the glory of God. In other words, we're returning what we've received into the potential to glorify God. Yep. Now, we said a while ago there's no shortage in God's supply. So surely we cannot assume there's a shortage of anything. When God breathed into existence this earth, he gave it life. And he gave it every single thing it needed to survive and prosper. Everything. Now, why would you think that you and I live in a world now that seems to suffer so much? It's because we did not put ourselves in a place, in a position to be blessed, to, to use the potential that God gave us. The potential's there. The provision's there. We just haven't used the potential. Good? By the way, if you're struggling right now and you're thinking about this, I want you to understand something. There is nothing too hard for God. Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what season of life you're in. It doesn't matter what you feel right now or what your hurts and aches are or where you are health-wise. There is nothing too hard for God. So when you and I think of God's provisions and think, well, gosh, God, your provisions are lacking here. It's not lack of provision. It's lack of priority. Okay, now we're going to get, it's going to get tough. 
You ready? The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. There is a principle. Seek first the kingdom of God. The principle. Write this down. If you've got something to write with, write it down. Because I'm telling you, you're going to walk out of here and you're going to go, what did he say? This is important. Seek first the king, kingdom of God. There is a principle. And these things will be added unto you. There's the blessing. So you can't get to the blessing without going through the principle. Listen very carefully, please. You cannot get to the blessing without going through the potential. How about the, uh, the principle? Some of us have a hard time with that, don't we? Because we say, God, I want the blessing. I just don't want to do anything to get to that point. I'm going to pray for blessings on my life. I'm going to pray for blessings on my family's life. I'm going to pray for, pray for blessings on my company, my corporation or whatever. And God's telling you, you know what? When you go through the principle, if you'll go through the principle and honor me first, then I'll bless it. When you and I prioritize our lives, God's provisions has a place to land. When we prioritize our lives, God's provisions has a place to land. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this. Uh, would one of you get my, Michael, would you get my little podium over here? Thank you. We seem to do better here when we have a visual, Right? Rodney, come here. Rodney Pugh, come here for a minute. You just happen to sit close enough. All right, I want, to, I want you to understand something. We have to understand that God does not operate on our timeline, right? And so here's what I, I want to use you. Now, I, I, how old are you? 40. Okay, you're not even halfway through life yet. That's good. That's good. We're going we're gonna to pretend like you have a really long life ahead of you here, okay? So turn this way for me. All right, this is God's timeline for you, right? Now, you started somewhere back here about 40 years ago, and we'll say somewhere back here, and we really can't see the end because we're going to assume that you're, you're going to live to be 100. Okay with that? Okay, all right. Which direction do you go in this timeline? Exactly. You always are moving forward. Always moving forward. Now, Rodney, unless he's God, can't, cannot, you're not God, right? Okay, good. I'm going to make sure you get. Uh, he can't move backwards in this. But you see, God's timeline is much different than Rodney's. God can not only move forward, God can move backwards. Now, God can't, not only can do that, God can move side to side. He can move up, and he can move down. He's not bound by the same timeline we are. Everybody got that? So in order to, for you, Roddy, to receive the provisions of God and reach the potential that God wants you to reach, there's something that you have to do. You have to continue to move forward. You have to continue to move forward. Now, here's the problem. Come back over here. We're going to scoot you back about 10 years, okay? All right. Stand on, stand on my timeline. <laughs> Y'all watching this? How many of you are in his ag class? He didn't follow instructions very well, does he? <laughs> uh, just stay like this, brother, okay? All right, good. All right. Now, here's the thing. If, if Rodney's moving through his life, and there's not but one way he can move, which is forward, Okay, we all agree with that, right? And he's moving forward, and something happens to Rodney in this season of, let's say, 45. Here's what happens with most of us. Most of us get into this season, and we get stuck. We get stuck in this season right here. And it's something that we don't have any control over we couldn't have done anything about it, even if we'd have wanted to, but it has affected us to the point that we're stuck in this season of our life. So time is still moving on, and Rodney's still moving on. There you go, that a boy. But he's stuck in a season that happened to him at age 45. 
Now, you want to know why 65 and 75-year-old people wound up not being any smarter than they were when they were 45? Because they keep reliving that same year over and over and over again. Keep reliving it. They're still stuck when they're 45, even when they're 65 or 75. Now, the thing about it is, is you can't get over a problem. Come back here. All right, we're going to come back to 45. You can't get over a problem in your life or a season in your life unless you move through the problem. Unless you move through it. Unless you say, you know what, God's got this, I don't understand, but I'm going to keep moving through my problem, and I'm not going to get it stuck in the middle of my problem and take my problem with me. You see, the provisions are there. God's got it. All the provisions are there. We just don't want to take a hold of the the provisions because we want to stay in the same spot that we were when we had the issue. Amen? Can't get over a problem unless you move through it. Now, here's the second thing. Come back here for one more time. I'm almost done with you. You've done good. All right. Can't go, can't get get over it unless you go through it, right? Now, here's the thing. God may be saying, Rodney may be right here at age 45 going, God, I don't get it. There's just, I'm having all kinds of issues. I'm coming to you in prayer. I'm being as faithful as I know how to be. I'm in church every Sunday morning. I'm giving my family. I'm praying with my family. I'm doing everything I can for you, God. And God says, you know what, Rodney? You're right. And you found favor in my eyes. But on your timeline... God walks down here because, remember, he's not bound by your timeline. He's not bound by anybody's timeline. He comes down here, and he drops the provision. He drops the provision in your timeline. Now, if Rodney stays stuck at age 45 and doesn't continue to move forward, you're never going to come up to that timeline. And you're never going to come up to that provision. Now, why does God do this? Because God knows that age 45, while you're in the middle of this, you may not be ready for that. But he says, you know, if you'll keep moving forward, if you'll keep moving, if you'll keep taking a hold of the provisions that I've given you, I'm going to bless you, but you need to walk into the blessing. You need to move towards the blessing. You need to have faith in me. You need to honor me. You need to keep your eyes focused on me. Don't keep your eyes focused on everything that happened to you back at 45 years old because we're not going to relive that year. I've got a blessing for you at 55 years old, but you're never going to see it unless you are in position to get it. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks. I'm telling you what, isn't that most of us? Most of us get stuck. We get stuck. You know, and I I bet I've talked to a thousand people, I've probably even done this myself, that just sit here and and when you sit down and talk to them and they're age 55, you know, 58, 60, something like that, they go, you know what, preacher, I just don't get it. I used to be. I used to be. Everything used to be going just fine for me. I never had a problem in in the world. And all of a sudden... My used to be has gotten horrible. And I'm telling you, I'm just in the middle of this stuff, and I don't see, I don't understand it. I can't figure out a way to get out of it. And God's saying, you know what? I allow this in your life. Think about this. I allow this in your life because at age 45 with Rodney, at age 45, you got a little cocky. You got a little cocky, and you started depending on yourself. You started thinking, hey, I'm right where I want to be. Everything's good. I don't need God anymore. I'm not saying he did that, by the way. He's not that kind of guy. But I don't need God anymore. And you started depending on you. And God says, you know, you don't understand. You see, I gave you every one of those steps in that timeline. And if I have to stop the harvest in your life to get you to understand that it's me that provided all that, then that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to stop the harvest. I'm going to stop the rain. I'm going to stop the crops. 
I'm going to stop the labor in your hands. Haggai says, God can stop whatever he wants to stop because he gave it to us to start with, right? Now, the thing is, and I think you know this, but I'm going to remind you. Just because you can do things with your hands, like Kayla and I are both drummers, and God gave us the ability to move all four limbs at the same time. But I guarantee you, Kayla will tell you, and I will tell you, if something were to break here, 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 or here, we're out of business. We're out of business, right? So God says, I gave you the ability, but I not only gave you the ability, I gave you the strength, I gave you the capacity, I gave you the potential to do whatever it is I've called you to do. But don't take your eyes off me. And don't forget where the blessing came from. You know, I don't know. I've talked to Dan about this a bunch. We had conversation a lot of I've seen some pretty stubborn guys in my day get flat on their back because God says, I cannot get your attention any other way. And if you want to figure out where the blessings of God comes from, get flat on your back looking nowhere but up, and then you will come to a realization that it wasn't me, it was God. It was God. The potential, the progress, the position. But by the way, the idea is when Rodney gets down here to however long God decides to let him live, we'll say 100. When he reaches that 100 years old, it's the glory of God and God's glory that Rodney will give God because he kept his eyes on him through that 100 years. So I want to ask you the question this morning. We're going to close up. Everybody bow their head. First of all, Haggai says, you know what? I want you to consider your ways today. All of us are walking on a timeline. All of us are walking towards death. And I know that just really depresses everybody. But hey, let's, let's face it. Statistics in death are really good. It's one out of one. One out of one. We're all marching to that end. So Haggai is asking you, God's asking you today, Consider your ways. What are you doing on the timeline, and who are you trusting on the timeline that God's given you for however long he's given it to you? And while you're on that, have you sown a lot of stuff in your lifetime? But has your harvest been scarce? In other words, what are you sowing? Are you sowing relationships are you sowing things that honor God? Are you sowing things that honor you? Because there's a big difference in those two. What are your priorities? And are your priorities out of whack? Have they been out of whack so much that you are now stuck on your timeline? And every year is age 45 or every year is age 55. You know, I don't think there's a single person in this place that doesn't want to experience the provisions and blessings of God. In fact, you all admitted that a while ago, that you believe God has all things and he can bless you, and I believe he will. But I want you to get into position today to be blessed. What's your position? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you in position to receive the harvest? Are you in position to receive the blessing? Are you in position to receive those things that you're going to need for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years as you go down your timeline to be a blessing to God? It starts with a relationship. And maybe you're stuck today, and maybe the reason why you're stuck today is because you don't have that relationship with God. Maybe you don't have that relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, and I have found in my life, I've experienced in my life, that it's very difficult to move through the stuck places in my life without Christ. If not impossible. 
So do you need Jesus Christ in your life first? So I want to give you the opportunity to receive that this morning. To become unstuck. Unstuck. Give your life to Christ today and let him lead and guide the rest of your timeline and help you get unstuck. It's not a hard thing to do. I'm not going to ask you to come down to the front. If you're visiting with us today, we don't do an altar call in that manner. I believe that God can speak to your heart right where you sit. It's not me that will save you. It's not any of the elders, any of the lay pastors, or anybody else in this church that can save you. It is Christ alone. Total commitment and belief in Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth... Jesus Christ is Lord and has risen from the dead. You will be saved. You know what the word saved means? That's awful complicated, well, you know, for church people. But saved means unstuck. Saved means unstuck. Saved means I don't have to relive that issue or that season in my life. Being unstuck means I can move forward in my walk with Christ Honoring him and blessing him because he is my God and he is my Savior. Are you ready to do that this morning? In the quietness of this moment, we're going to pray. And I'm just going to ask that to yourself, you don't have to do this with anybody else, but to yourself, I'm going to ask you to kind of repeat this prayer. But I'm going to ask you to be very sincere about this. Because God can tell when you're faking it. God can tell if you're faking it to make it. So be very sincere with this. And ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to be your God, be your Savior, be your Lord, be your Master. But I'm going to tell you something. When you do that, that means you're no longer in charge. He is. Father, we come to you today. Father, I thank you for this time. Father, I thank you for all these wonderful people that have come into your presence today, Father. Father, we just ask that there be somebody here this morning, Father, that does not know you as a personal Lord and Savior, that they will not take another second without any other thought, Father. They will just say, you know what, I am ready to be unstuck in my life, and I want to turn my life over to you. Father, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, every sin that I've ever committed. You took my place on Calvary, you took my thorns, you took my scars, and you took my nails. Father, you did that for me because you love me. You did that for me so that I would not walk through this life being stuck. Father, I believe that not only did you die on Calvary for my sin, Father, but that you rose from the grave. Father, that you defeated hell, you defeated death, and you defeated sin. Father, I believe that because you are mine and I am yours, that I can call on you, talk to you, and that you would lead me through the rest of my timeline. Father, thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the future blessings. Thank you for the provisions that are always there when I need them. Father, you're ruler and creator over all things. And today I give my life to you. Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. That's so what I'd like for you to do as the band comes. Um, I'd like for you to consider this. The Bible says consider your ways. I want you to consider this. If you've given your heart and life to Christ, I'd like to talk to you about baptism, which, by the way, we have another baptism today. Isn't that awesome? But I want you to think about this. If you're ready to take that step, I'd like to talk to you about it. On the, by the door over here is, on the communication table is a little green card. And on that card it says, I gave my life to Christ today. I'd like to know more about being a Christian. And I'd like to talk to you about what it means to be baptized. The second thing is, is if you're looking for a church home that you can move forward in your timeline in with your family and bless God, this is the perfect place to do it right here. The third thing is, and I'm going to mention this for just a minute, and listen very carefully, is because sometimes, sometimes we don't like to talk about tithing. And this is not a tithing sermon, although it could have been. But we don't like to talk about tithing because tithing means that I'm giving up something sometimes I don't really want to give up. 
right? But let me go back to point number one in this message. What belongs to God? Everything. Okay, so he had your money long before you did. Amen. And the thing about it is, is it's not that God needs your money. He doesn't need anything. He already has it all. What he's saying is, is that for you to be obedient and keep your eyes on me and follow me through that timeline, I want you to be obedient to me and give back 10% of what you've made. That's why we tithe. Because we're being obedient. So I want to encourage you to, to consider that as well. If you're ready to start doing that, you can do that in the green and white containers that are over here by the doors. But I want to assure you of one thing. That money goes to minister in this church. That's what it's for. Amen. All right? Uh, and, uh, and you need to be aware of that. And I know that uh, we've gone through a society and a culture of preachers in this country that have totally abused all this. I get it. But I want you to understand that if you have a question about where our money goes, and you want to know, you want to know if this church is abusing your tithes, come talk to this lady right here. Because I, I will, she has the authority to show you where everything goes. And I want to promise you one thing. Every single dime goes to benefit and glorify God. Amen. Every bit of it. It's part of our worship. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to get ready for baptism. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. my real, real blessed privilege to present to you John Ford for baptism. And John, uh, the congregation would like to give you this Bible to guard your heart, mind, and soul against attacks from Satan and this world. So congratulations. God bless you. Thank you. It's warm. Okay, just sit down on that stool. There we go. Cross your arms. 
Uh, I got to tell you a little bit about John. John happened into this church because of this guy right over here. And um, uh, he and uh, Roger Gaines work at the tire shop together up here. And I, I know that uh, they've been talking back and forth about who God is and what he is. And the thing about it is, this is why I'm so glad that, John, you're getting baptized today because you was a perfect example of what we were just talking about. It's being in position to be blessed. Being in position to be blessed. You see, I don't think it was any accident that God put you in at the tire shop with Roger Gaines. I don't believe it was any accident at all. God had a plan. God went all the way around John's timeline and said, you know what? I know where he is. I know what he's doing. And we're going to put him in a position with a guy that knows Jesus. And they're going to talk about Jesus. How about that? Isn't that awesome? So, John, is it your profession of faith that you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, but then raised to walk in a newness of life. Ready? <laughs> Amen. God is good. All the time. God, oh, stand with me. Tad's going to dismiss us. Father, thank you so much. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for bringing us all out here today. And thank you so much for all the many blessings that you give to us each and every day. And we ask you to take this message, sear it into our hearts so that we can be in position to be blessed, so that we can witness your love and your power. And Father, be with us as we go home and bring us all home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's message, and we hope you'll come and give us a look this Sunday. Here you'll find some of the finest country gospel music in the state of Texas, along with good, sound, Bible-based preaching. And I promise you'll always be greeted with a handshake and a smile. Won't you come join us this Sunday at 10.30 a.m., and we'll have the coffee ready.